In our previous lecture, we had discussed the climactic year of 1918 and how Germany's last gamble on the Western Front failed, leading to the plea for an armistice or a ceasefire. In this lecture, we'll examine the fascinating scene that emerged as the armistice was signed, the emotions that were unleashed by this important event. When the guns at last fell silent on the Western Front on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock in the morning, with the armistice, those who had survived the Great War experienced a tidal wave of different emotions. Some felt grief, others felt anger, loss, a sense of relief, exultation, or furious desire for revenge. In this lecture, we'll seek to explore that range of responses to the conclusion of the war and the many divergent hopes that were vested in the upcoming peace settlement that would finally order the outcome of the war itself. With the armistice, the hatred that had been building up over years would, as it turns out, impede the reconciliation that perhaps should have followed. And indeed, many Germans would find it difficult fundamentally to accept that they had in fact lost the war at all. We'll consider finally in our lecture a crowning horror in the concluding stages of this conflict, a natural disaster following on this man-made disaster, a worldwide pandemic that swept the globe, the so-called Spanish influenza that killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide. The news of the war's close on the Western Front was met with mixed emotions. As the guns ended their firing on the Western Front and a great stillness finally settled on the battlefields, many contemporaries felt that now was the time to take stock of the war, the coming peace, and the emotions that they themselves were feeling. And these emotions were of a wide range. The defeated could feel despair and fury at their condition and a lack of understanding as to how had it come to this. The victors would feel some very complex mixture of celebration as well as mourning, because even in victory, nonetheless, it was true that the sacrifices had been enormous. And in Central and Eastern Europe, there was also a mood of exaltation, of celebration of new independence that was achieved by some peoples that earlier had not had their own states. It's important throughout our discussions of the moods and the emotions that would accompany peace to keep in mind one fundamental fact. Even with the armistice, the ceasefire on the Western Front, the war did not neatly end. In fact, it would in particular continue in aftershocks in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, as we'll be discussing in a later lecture. It speaks volumes, however, about the longing for peace that had been built up, even in advance of the formal ceasefire itself, that in the case of the American public, uh, there was a premature announcement of the ceasefire on November 7th, so days before the official ceasefire of November 11th, um, a news reporter had simply misunderstood events that were unfolding around him on the Western Front and had cabled back the news that the ceasefire had officially been declared, uh, and American cities and towns erupted into vast celebration. Uh, some people simply even ignored the fact that later there was an official announcement that this was too early and, and was not uh, a true announcement of an actual ceasefire. Um, in American media history, we certainly have had many cases of, uh, of misinformation or the spread of wrong news. This was an especially bitter one uh, for some in that moment as they longed for the news at last of an end to the war finally. At the same time, this, the armistice, when it finally arrived, brought a great stillness, brought a great quiet to what had been the clamor and clash of battle, and it would now be necessary to take stock of the situation as it stood. The armistice itself was signed with German representatives who were brought in uh, to sign the armistice at 5 a.m., very early in the morning, on November 11th. The armistice was signed in a railway carriage at the forest of Compiègne near Paris. And afterwards, this railway carriage and the, uh, the furniture from inside of it, the tables and chairs where the armistice had been signed, uh, were later taken off to a French military museum and sort of hailed as relics of this great triumph. Uh, 
during World War II, when Hitler crushed the French and uh, intended to humiliate them thoroughly, he, with a, a keen symbolic sense, had that very same railway carriage and the same furniture brought out for the signing by the defeated French of an armistice. So uh, there was certainly ramifications and, and echoes that were to be heard in the years afterwards. The terms of the armistice were drawn up very care carefully by the Allied forces to reflect the determination of General Foch, uh, in charge of the Allied war effort now, that Germany should not be allowed to use this ceasefire as a chance to regroup and to reinforce its efforts and to continue the war. In fact, this armistice was to be the acknowledgement of defeat. And the terms made this clear. The terms included Germany undertaking to withdraw from all occupied territory. But there was an interesting footnote here. Uh, this didn't include the vast territories in Eastern Europe that were occupied by the German forces. Uh, and the reason for this exception on the Eastern Front, or what had been the Eastern Front, uh, was already a growing fear on the part of Western forces of that strange ideological force in the East, Bolshevism, and its communist ideology. Anxieties grew that uh, this might be a spreading ideology, and thus uh, even the defeated Germans might still play a role in containing the threat of this radical revolutionary ideology. At the same time, and this was the fulfillment of a long-held dream for French nationalists and French patriots, Alsace-Lorraine, the lost provinces that had been seized by the Germans after the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, would at long last be returned to France. And there was great celebration, uh, ecstatic celebration, as French troops would move into these earlier lost provinces. The German Rhineland was to be cleared of German troops. It was to be turned into a demilitarized zone, and the Allies would move in as occupying forces to take over strategic bridgeheads along the Rhine at Mainz, Koblenz, and Cologne. Uh, this, in some sense, had a real symbolic resonance. Many of those same bridges had been used to shuttle across German troops when the Schlieffen Plan counted down at the start of the war in 1914. Now they were to come under Allied occupation precisely to forestall the possibility of another such invasion or aggression. German military materiel, as well as the large German high seas fleet, uh, which, uh, whose intentions of uh, sallying out for a death ride had been frustrated by sailors' mutinies, were now to be turned over to the Allies wholesale to ensure that Germany could not continue the war. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, by which the Germans had ratified their triumph, this remarkable triumph on the Eastern Front, also became invalid. Germany would have to pay for the damage caused by the war, and the British naval blockade would continue while negotiations for the final terms of the peace would take place. Um, this in, was a remarkable and dramatic uh, element of the uh, armistice terms, that the naval blockade, which had caused economic privations as well as hunger on the German, war front, uh, German home front, would continue. Uh, at the same time, there already were some provisions and negotiations that would take place for the provision of emergency food supplies to the German civilian population, but it speaks volumes about the mutual distrust and hatred uh, among the parties that now would be negotiating the peace, uh, that for a long time it was difficult to agree on the terms with which or through which the emergency food supplies would be delivered. Uh, German authorities were worried that if they allowed German ships to be used for the bringing of these emergency supplies, those ships might very well be confiscated in the long run. Uh, so in some sense, even the German government itself was impeding the swifter delivery of these food supplies. But the pressure of the naval blockade would certainly remain. At first, the armistice was set for 36 days, uh, but the armistice was later renewed and then indefinitely prolonged as negotiations were carried on for the final treaty itself. The German delegation that signed the armistice agreement at Compiègne was led by the Catholic Center Party politician Matthias Erzberger, who was identified now with those parties that had spearheaded the peace resolution in the Reichstag earlier, uh, 
uh, who had argued for a piece of compromise, uh, Erzberger was playing a role here that would raise the ire of many German nationalists. And later, indeed, he was assassinated uh, by a death squad for his role in signing the armistice in 1921. Now Germans would have to await the terms of the peace that the Allies would announce. Germans at this point seized on to, with sort of a desperate intensity, the hope for what they called a Wilson peace. And that meant a peace of moderate terms that would be along the ide idealistic lines that Woodrow Wilson's rhetoric had announced before, based on the 14 points speech of January 8, 1918. Uh, there were even mass demonstrations in which one could see posters held up. Only the 14 points posters announced. Germans at this point were slow to realize the extent to which the last stages of the war, the spring offensive of 1918, as well as the harsh terms of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk imposed upon a defeated Russia, had hardened Allied sentiments, uh, including those of Woodrow Wilson, uh, and the terms would be far harsher than they had expected. The ceasefire itself came into effect at 11 a.m. on November 11th. The guns fell silent, and the war had lasted 52 months. The reactions to the news of the armistice are, are really compelling to examine, and in some sense they represented a, a bookend to the experience of the First World War. We had spoken earlier in uh, one of our first lectures about the August madness of 1914. So now, too, there were remarkable scenes of mass psychology to be observed in the reactions to the formal end of the war. Allied Western Europe uh, was an example of, of celebration, which could take quieter as well as more raucous forms. Reportedly, from the evidence that we have, in the front lines of the trenches, as the firing finally ended, the mood was not one of raucous celebration, but rather quiet exhaustion and uh, simply a, an end to energy. In the capitals of the Western Allies, the pictures were very different. In London, riotous celebrations broke out and there were reports of strangers making love in public. In Paris, the bells rang, crowds paraded down the boulevards, probably in, in scenes that might have reminded people of the August madness of 1914, cheering and celebrating, and crowds also gathered at symbolically significant spots, such as the statue, uh, a, a statue representing allegorically the city of Strasbourg in the lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine, which now was being celebrated and cheered as finally returning to France in a symbolic sense as well. Allied soldiers, when they could be found in the streets of Paris, would be hoisted up onto the shoulders of some of these celebrating civilian crowds and would be carried aloft, British, American, and French soldiers being celebrated as the victors. Trophy cannon, which had been captured from the German troops, were now symbolically in, in triumphant processions pulled by civilians down the Rue de Rivoli in a vivid celebration of victory. This celebration also extended to the more remote and secret areas of the war effort. At Porton Down in Britain, where the secret gas warfare laboratory had been working intensively over all of the years previous, uh, the guards, as well as some of the workers, got drunk in the celebration, and some of these guards apparently released apes who had been used in the experimentation, uh, who then terrorized the countryside until they were captured once again. Uh, there are still, in fact, symbolic remnants of these celebrations in the mood of exultation and jubilation at peace arriving at last. A Belgian beer was created, which was dedicated to peace itself. And it, in fact, bore and still bears the name Pax. It's still produced today and, and certainly uh, is a, a survival of those celebrations. At the same time, we keenly can imagine that alongside these loud public celebrations, inescapably, there were many quiet moments and takings of stock. Inescapably, private sorrows would also be felt in quieter corners, even of victorious countries, as widows, orphans, bereaved parents and siblings thought of the sacrifices that had gone into the end of the war.
At the same time, it's very important to keep in mind that Eastern Europe represented in its reactions to the end of the war significantly different emphases. The formal closing of the war had a similarly mixed reaction in Eastern Europe, a mixed reception, but at the same time, an added element was present as well, and that was the celebration of national independence in countries where nationalist dreams of at long last achieving one's own control over one's own territory and land seem to be achieved. And, and to my mind, there's one key symbolic fact that better than all others can really sum up this phenomenon, the, the meaning attached to the First World War as a war that had produced national independence. And this fact is to be seen in Poland and in Polish collective memory to this very day. November 11th, which is celebrated as a, uh, a holiday in memory of soldiers and of the experience of war in the West, November 11th, by contrast, in Poland, is celebrated as the day of national independence, when at long last, after decades of not existing on the map of Europe, a resurrected Poland again emerged onto the European political landscape. And the same was true in many other independent countries that now emerged in Central and Eastern Europe out of the wreckage of fallen empires, celebrating their new existence, even as they were still threatened in their fragile beginnings and in young republics. Germany was an entirely different case. Germany was defeated. Many Germans were now glad of the fact that the war was over, but simply incredulous at the news of their defeat. Many were psychologically unprepared for this revelation. Censorship and propaganda had often hidden the true fortunes of the war. And this was even the case among some nationalist politicians who complained that they had been lied to as uh, the war, as it turns out, was now lost. The propaganda reports from the front had read, at worst, all quiet on the Western Front, and otherwise had announced tremendous victories. And now people were being forced to confront the fact that the war had been lost. There was also another fact on the military battlefield that made it additionally very difficult for ordinary people to take aboard, without the full information that someone like Ludendorff might have had, the reality that Germany had simply lost the war. German armies and German lines of trenches on the, on the battlefield stood not on German soil, but on foreign soil. How is it possible to lose the war and yet nonetheless be victorious, so it seemed, by fighting on enemy soil? In addition, the sheer momentum of the dramatic events of the end of the war were very hard to take in. In quick succession, the Kaiser abdicated, a new German Democratic Republic had been declared, and then two days later, the armistice and Germany has lost the war. Some very important psychological things we can intuit were taking place at precisely this time in the German public. In the humiliation of this news of defeat, for many Germans, the new democracy that was emerging at the same time would come to be associated with the feelings of failure, and shame. And thus it was that at precisely this moment, a conspiracy theory was emerging that, that suggested that Germany hadn't lost the war. This came to be called the stab in the back legend. And in fact, even though it came out in full force at precisely this time, uh, it already had been percolating for some time previous during the war itself. It was part of a larger process of finding scapegoats for those events when the war was not going well. Uh, we'll recall in particular the Jewish census of 1916 that already had been singling out the German Jews uh, as scapegoats for German reverses on the battlefield. The stab in the Mac legend had also been encouraged by someone like Ludendorff, an earlier war dictator of Germany who now was casting about for others to blame, whether they were civilian authorities or other political factions within Germany to blame for his own failures. The stab in the back legend argued that the German armies, in fact, had not been defeated on the battlefield, but had been undermined by dark and treacherous forces on the home front.
In particular, the democratic revolutionaries of 1918, those who had inaugurated Germany's new experiment with democracy, would be denounced by nationalists in resonant terms as the November criminals, suggesting that this revolution had been an act of treachery from its beginning. One, at this time, obscure, ordinary German soldier by the name of Adolf Hitler, who was recovering as this news rolled in uh, from being gassed in Belgium in, back in October of 1918, recovering in a hospital in eastern Germany, heard the news of Germany's defeat and was shattered by this revelation. He went blind in what probably represented a hysterical reaction and afterwards would claim that in that blindness he had had visions that instructed him of his mission to restore Germany's greatness in the future. The losses of the First World War were ones that would be difficult for the vanquished as well as the victors to take aboard. And, and it speaks volumes about the scale of the First World War's totality, that the number of deaths was so huge that it cannot, in fact, even today, be determined with precision. Nonetheless, the numbers were horrific, even in their approximation. Germany had lost almost 2 million dead, Austria-Hungary about 1.5 million. On the side of the Allies, Russia had lost 1.7 million, France nearly 1.5 million, Britain nearly a million, Italy half a million, and the Americans over 100,000. The gener generational losses were crushing. In France, 17% of those who served in the war were killed an entire generation damaged. Altogether, according to a quite conservative estimate, some nine million soldiers died as a result of the war. And we need, in trying to take aboard the enormity of that figure, to keep in mind uh, in, of the, the ripple effect of these losses. Every dead soldier left behind family and relationships that were shattered by that loss as well in, in sort of a spreading impact of grief. The injuries, uh, even of those who were not killed outright, were significant. 20 million men, according to best estimates, were wounded, and 7 million of these were probably disabled in a permanent way as a result of their wounds. What we can't know with any precision is how many of these soldiers would suffer from psychological disturbances long after the war, and even those who survived physically would often later consider themselves a haunted lost generation that had lost something of its energy, something of its confidence and its sense of purpose in this disillusioning war. The economic damage reckoned alongside these huge losses of people and of lives was also enormous. A report from 1920 that tried to take stock of this estimated the cost of the war at the astronomical figure of $337 billion. Besides the immediate losses of the war were other losses uh, of markets, for instance, to neutral countries or to the United States, as well as the plague of inflation that obtained in all of the combatant countries. Equally diff difficult to quantify, but nonetheless significant, uh, were what contemporaries saw as a shattered confidence in that prime idea of European and Western civilization uh, at the start of the century, the notion of progress. Here, quite vividly, it was the case that technological advances and an advanced civilization had been turned to the purpose of murder. And then there was a crowning horror, a, a natural disaster that overtook the world even as the war was drawing to a close. This was a devastating pandemic called the Spanish Influenza. Uh, contrary to its name, which suggested that it had come from Spain, uh, even though its origins remain not entirely clear, um, medical historians seem to agree that the epidemic apparently appeared first in Haskell County, Kansas, in the United States in early 1918. While the war itself didn't cause this pandemic, and historians debate the extent to which the privations and the suffering of the war might have made populations more vulnerable. That's still debated. The movement of troops and ships as a result of the war, as well as perhaps the weakened constitutions of civilians in warring countries, apparently facilitated the spread of this pandemic disease. The disease spread to Europe and to other parts of the world, mutating in several waves of infection. 
Though spreading from the United States itself, apparently, the pandemic came to be called the Spanish flu because neutral Spain, without the same sort of censorship of news that applied in other countries that suppressed the news of the scale of this disease as it spread, in neutral Spain, the reports of the disease were not downplayed as they were in warring countries, and thus the impression was formed that Spain is where it hit first and hardest. The disease was especially horrifying because it, with enormous rapidity, attacked a victim and seemed to especially zero in on the young and the healthy. This virus probably killed another 50 million people around the world, mostly in the fall of 1918. And this figure of 50 million is, um, though it's higher than earlier estimates, is still a quite conservative one. Earlier estimates talked about 20 million lives taken by the Spanish influenza. More current figures are suggesting perhaps up to 100 million deaths worldwide. This disease killed more people in one year than the medieval plague, the Black Death, had over 100 years. Most recent estimates that are now taking in stock the global reach of this pandemic suggest that maybe 17 million people died in India, and some figures suggest that maybe 2% of the entire population of Africa died as a result as well. In towns in the United States, as well as elsewhere in the world, the death rate was so high that not enough coffins could be produced for the dead, and attempts were made to, through fumigation or the wearing of masks or other disinfection procedures to protect oneself against this mysterious disease, uh, but ultimately, while they were ineffectual, the disease seems simply to have burned itself out by taking all of the hosts uh, that it might have uh, as it spread. And then a very interesting thing followed upon this intense suffering and mortality of the Spanish influenza. Not long after this devastating pandemic, the memory of this disease seemed to be seemingly effaced from collective consciousness. People didn't talk about it. It was somehow obliterated from historical memory uh, and to a great extent from popular historical consciousness, including especially in the United States. And the question presents itself, why? How could a disease of this proportion be forgotten? Did the tragedy of the World War overshadow this disaster and produce, as it were, a sort of short-circuiting of grief by overloading our capacity for suffering? Was the enormity, perhaps, of this natural disaster something that one could not fully comprehend or take in? Whatever the case, the phenomenon of the Spanish influenza is something that medical experts warn us is not unique and not a one-time occurrence. Epidemiologists who study such diseases warn that pandemics like the Spanish influenza of 1918 certainly can recur in our own time and in fact, with a great deal of anxiety, they're watching for the next outbreak of this sort of worldwide disease. At this point, in the context of such continuing mortality and suffering, which worked in tandem with the hopes and the grief of the war itself, the question was, how would one move forward? How would one start to rebuild? On January 18th, 1919, in Paris, the formal opening of peace negotiations took place. However, hatreds built up over the last years of the war would increasingly impede a peace settlement. In the case of France, popular opinion strongly and loudly demanded that Germany be punished for its aggression, made to pay, and that in the future, somehow, French security, which had been violated, had to be guaranteed. Otherwise, the war would have been in vain. In elections that were held in Great Britain in December of 1918, after the war itself ended, uh, the sentiment was very similar. This was often called the khaki elections, after the khaki color of uh, British uniforms, uh, precisely because they were so dominated by military issues. In these elections, Lloyd George and his coalition won a decisive vote of confidence, and they ruled until 1922, and they won this vote of confidence on the strength of promises of making the Germans pay in the peace negotiations. A common demand was hang the Kaiser. And it was also demanded that people like General Ludendorff, uh, the war dictator of Germany, uh, as well as scientists like Fritz Haber, who had helped produce poison gas, 
be put on trial for violations against international law. At the same time, as they awaited the news of what the peace would be like, many Germans still remained very skeptical that they had even, in fact, lost the war. At the same time, most generally, in the context of such negotiations, even the victorious Allied powers, as they prepared to dictate the terms of the peace, would have to wrestle with the question of what the concept of victory might even conceivably mean after the losses of such magnitude that they had experienced. One other consequence of this war of decisive effect was the toppling of age-old dynasties and thrones, the overthrowing of an entire traditional political order in Central and Eastern Europe was an aftershock of the war itself that we'll consider in our next lecture.